Tare mai ki te aka o aroha noa. Welcome to Grace Vineyard Church and welcome to Grace at Your Place. We have got a special service lined up. You're going to hear from one of our team sharing a simple message in a moment. We've got some incredible worship. We're going to worship together. And uh, before that, I'm just going to pray. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us. Thank you that you know all the details of our lives. You know how we've come today. You know the things that are concerning us and worrying us. And so we just hand all of that over to you right now. And we ask that you would be with us. Thank you that you promise to be with us wherever we are. And wherever you are, there is freedom. So I speak that freedom in the name of Jesus this morning. I pray that people would encounter your peace. Would you come and bring your refreshing, Would you come and bring your encouragement in Jesus' name? Amen. Let's worship.
Well, today I want to um, talk about living a radically generous life. And I don't know whether you know it, but our church has a reputation of being radically generous. I don't know whether you know that. But when I travel to different places, I find that all sorts of people have heard of some of the things that we've done. Uh, many of you were not around when the earthquakes happened, but uh, what happened was at our beach campus, it was uh, one place that, that wasn't too badly damaged. We set up a rescue centre there. Uh, we commandeered a local hall and we set up a free supermarket where food was helicoptered in and members of our team and other churches and, and different people came and volunteered. We were feeding up to 10,000 people a day which was incredible. Other people volunteered and came and uh, were digging liquefaction out of people's backyards. We actually bought some trailers and we helped people to move their house. Uh, we got different supplies brought in for people. We opened up beach campus so that people had the only electricity that was available in the area so they could charge phones, watch the news, contact people. And... Uh, some of it was recorded and got on YouTube and went around the world. And as I've travelled in different places, people have said to me, are you from that church that uh, helped the community after the earthquake? And I proudly am able, able to say, yeah, yes, I'm from that church. Actually, uh, an assistant pastor came up to me once and he said, you know, when that earthquake thing happened, and uh, a, a video came out of the things that you were doing. He said, my senior pastor pulled me aside, showed me the video of all your teams working and, and bringing in supplies and, and helping people in different ways. He said, look at this church. He said, my desire is that we would become a church like that. Now, I, I didn't tell him that the way you become a church like that is have a massive earthquake in the city and, and then you've got something to respond to. But actually, you don't need to have a massive earthquake in a city to be able to respond to the needs that are going on because there are always massive needs that are happening in a city. And it was incredible because when the earthquake happened, it was actually um, the local senior sergeant, Roy Appley, uh, who called me. He was actually a Christian guy, a Salvation Army man. And he called up and he said uh, to me, I know you guys are involved a lot in the community and we're really stretched for help. Would you come and help us? Because I know you've got an amazing volunteer base. And you see what happens in civil defence situations, often you're bringing together people who've never worked together before and everything's great in theory. One of the things that Roy, the senior sergeant, realises is that churches are doing these things all the time. And so he called on us and, and we were able to help and people uh, gave tremendously generously, not just from our church, from, but from other churches and places as well. You know, Leanne Dalziel, who's recently been the Mayor of Christchurch, was actually the MP for Christchurch East at the time. And uh, I don't think she'd always look particularly favourably on churches, but she said to me, this is the first time I've seen a church doing what I think Christianity should look like. And I said, what do you mean by that? She said, getting out of the, of the building and actually doing something, you know, actually helping the community. And she actually very kindly, uh, when she was speaking in a public place just after that, said, and I don't think this is altogether true, but I didn't mind her saying it. She said, the east of Christchurch was saved by the local police sergeant and Grace Vineyard Church. And I thought, well, even if that's not entirely true, there's an enormous number of people that did great things. Isn't it wonderful that a church is recognised by doing what we should actually be doing anyway, being Christians? But you know what? Uh, the things that we have done have not been limited to the earthquake. I mean, even in the time of the pandemic, uh, so many people gave huge sums of money and lots of volunteer hours and our Kairos ministry absolutely exploded so that we were delivering tonnes and tonnes of food and, and practical um, uh, help to different people in our communities, so much so that the government social services recognised that we were being incredibly effective and actually said they would pay us, give us money to buy supplies because our team was so effective in what they're doing. 
Actually, they've done exactly the same thing with our Compassion Trust. Uh, we do free budgeting services and, and a number of other things as well. And uh, the government actually said, you are being more effective in the ways that you're using money to help people than we are in some of our services. So we would like you to to, to give you money so you do it rather than us doing it. Because they recognise that, that churches are often a lot more trusted than a government department is. And also churches have wraparound services. Friends, do you know what this is? This is just Christianity. This is what we should be doing anyway, but it does make me proud because when there is a problem in society, our church has always stood up and said, let's roll our sleeves up. Let's help and do things wherever we can. And look, I could spend the next two or three hours giving you stories of things that have done, not only just us as a team, but also individuals helping people to do some radically generous things. Do you know we have numbers of people in our church that have uh, helped other people to buy a house? We actually have one family I know of that actually just outright bought a house for another family. They saw that this family was in need. There was no way that they would be able to buy a house. And so they said, you know what? We've got the wherewithal to do this. We're gonna just buy this house for this family. Now, what they did is they gathered their children around and they said, look, this you know, is potentially your inheritance here, but we feel this is what God's calling us to do. What do you think? And all of the children said, we think this is awesome, Mum and Dad. We're right behind you. And I know several other families that have done it pretty much the same sort of thing. Maybe not necessarily outright buying a house, but some have invested huge amounts of money to help a person buy a house, or they might have had a rental house and they've sold it to a family at a ridiculously reduced price to help people to get into their first house. Isn't that generous? Isn't that generous? Like these are people that are not their family. They're not their relatives. They're just people that are in need and people say, I would like to do something radical to help you. And that's what I'm talking about. I know lots of people that are just secretly, privately doing these types of things and they don't make any song and dance about it at all. I was at a funeral in recent times and I bumped into several people and at the funeral and I said, oh, I didn't know that you knew the people, you know, the person that started. And they said, they have been very generous to us and started to recount story after story of ways that this couple had massively financially blessed them. And I went to person after person who was telling us similar stories. And I thought, oh my goodness, who would ever have guessed that these people not making a song and dance just very quietly are helping other people to get ahead. Friends, do you know what that's called? It's called Christianity. This is what Christianity actually is. Now look, most of us do not have the funds to buy another person a house or even help buy another person a house. Some of us are paying off our own mortgages, you know, and we're struggling with that. But it's not the amount of money that counts. It's the attitude of heart. Do you know, uh, I was just thinking today, we have people that even work on our own staff that are massively generous with their time. As well as working their five-day week here, they'll come along and serve on a Sunday as well. And uh, we have one person who's actually up here doing the notices today, Hamish. Do you know, during the pandemic, and he'll be terribly embarrassed I say this, during the pandemic, um, when we had a very little time to be able to um, do programs that go out on the internet. We got given some cameras and a bit of gear. Nobody quite knew what to do. Hamish would spend week after week working all night getting the programs ready so that they would go on the internet so that people could see them and then on to Shine TV. No extra pay, no you know double time or anything like that. He would work into the wee small hours of the night just so the program would be right. And then Ian, You can look at him, he's on sound. He would do exactly the same thing. Just work into the wee small hours, making sure that all the sound 
came as well. So yes, they do get paid by a church, but they didn't get paid for all the extra long things they do. And you know, every week, there are people that come and serve us on a Sunday that have got really busy jobs. You know, you've got plenty plenty of other things in your life. You could be out just saying, oh, it's my day of rest. But we have multiple people that come and say, I'm gonna serve, I'm gonna help because I want to bless other people and it is a blessing. So it is a a privilege to be part of a church that is so generous. And as well as that, people are generous towards the things that we do. You may not know this, but as well as the, the tithes and offerings and things that we get that keep the church going, there are all these other projects we do that people give massively generously to. We've just done uh, a season of missions where we raised over a quarter of a million dollars. Isn't that phenomenal? That's people giving above and beyond the normal stuff. So we have been able to be giving uh, money that goes a lot further in third world countries than it does, does here. So we've been able to build whole churches at once. We had a a pastor from Cambodia that came and visited us recently during Missions Month and we had just built him a whole church. You know, we're struggling to build our own church, you know, at the moment in Durham Street. But but we were proud to be able to give, I think it was $100,000 to build a whole church for him. We've built other whole churches in Mozambique, you know, where people have been worshipping under a tree And so it's been able to provide shelter for people. This is your money and your kindness. And it's not just one person giving a huge amount here. It's lots of people giving little bits individually. Becca said that earlier on. You know, uh, she said, you know, somebody in Christchurch won $33 million. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if they just came and just did all these great projects? But you know, God spoke to me years ago and said, I don't work that way. You know, what I do is, I work in every individual heart so that everybody gives a little bit as they are able. That's what the Scripture says. It says, give as you are able. Some people are able to give a tiny bit. Some people are able to give larger amounts, but together it becomes blessed. And not only that, we have put whole wings on orphanages. We put a whole wing on an orphanage uh, in Mexico in the last couple of years. We built a whole wing uh, in Uganda, in, uh, in an orphanage there. They call it the Grace Vineyard Wing. They said, no, you don't need to put our name on it, but they have, they put it in, in, in big letters, Grace Vineyard. And uh, we have built a medical clinic or helped to build a medical clinic in Uganda and a whole team of our people are gonna be going out there to visit as well. And these are just some, I could go on and on and on about the different projects that people have been involved in. Do you know out at West Campus, they've had this incredible heart to build a hub in the community because they, at West Campus, they worship in the Wigram School. And, but they said, you know, we're not reaching out into the community during the week. So, uh, uh, you know, the Grace family has put in some money, but they have been raising money to uh, open this hub, which is going to be, is, is, is open now. It's in the main street of, uh, of Wigram in that little area. And it's cost about a hundred grand to be able to do it up and we're leasing it, but it's been all been fitted out. And they're raising money because they have a vision that they want people in the community to come in and be blessed. And it hasn't, like nobody's given some, you know, most of it. Everybody's given bits and pieces and the community gets blessed. Friends, I wanna tell you that one of the great marks of Christianity through the ages since the time of Jesus is radical generosity. And we see in Luke chapter 19, verses one to 10, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not see because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, and this is the key bit, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. Notice it wasn't everything, half of it though. 
I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. I've always been intrigued by that story. Just to give you a little bit of context, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a Jewish man. So he was one of Jesus' people. But there are a couple of things against him. Number one, he was a tax collector and nobody in those days liked tax collectors. Read between the lines. Um, so they didn't like tax collectors. But what was, what was worse was the fact that the taxes were being collected on behalf of the Romans. So the Romans had invaded Israel. They were the enemy overseers. And what they did is they looked for traitors amongst the Jews who would come and work with them and take the taxes off their own people. Now, what was even worse than that is that Zacchaeus was a thief. He was not an honest man. So he was working for the enemy, the Romans. He was a tax collector and he was dishonest. So he would come and get the taxes from his own people, but he would always add more on that he wanted because he could determine how much he got. So he would say if he was gonna collect $100 from a family, he would say $120, please. And he would pocket the other money himself. Everybody hated him. And that's why when Jesus said, I'm gonna come to your place for lunch, everybody was horrified and thought, how could this man be a prophet? Doesn't he realise that this man's a sinner? Doesn't he realise that he's a betrayer? Doesn't he realise that this man's a thief? But Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And he came, he he encountered Zacchaeus and instantly something happened in Zacchaeus' heart. Something radically changed in that moment. You see, Zacchaeus had, I would say, a a demonic spirit of greed. He had a demonic spirit that had closed him up and closed his heart up and kept him away from anything that was good. And when he encountered Jesus, my opinion is that he was set free from that demonic spirit because something radically changed. And suddenly, the first thing he says is, Half of everything I own is going to be given away, half of it. And if I've ever cheated anybody, not only will I pay them back what I've stolen, I will pay back four times as much. Now, do you know what the most intriguing part of the story is? Jesus makes this incredible declaration over Zacchaeus. Jesus said, salvation has come to this house today. Do you know what the word salvation means? It means to be saved. He was declaring a person saved. Jesus virtually doesn't do that anywhere in the Bible. And just look at this. Jesus did not preach the gospel to him. He did not tell him the four spiritual laws. He didn't hand him out a tract. He didn't say, could you bow your heads and close your eyes and put up your hand? Thank you, brother, I see that. And he didn't do any of that. There was no altar call. He didn't invite people to come to the front. But he saw a radical thing happening and he thought to himself, this guy's got it. And the only thing that happened is that Zacchaeus became radically generous. And Jesus said, this man has got saved today for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. You know, in Jesus' time, that was what He was looking for. He was looking for people uh, who were radically generous. And you'll notice that anybody that stuck around Jesus became radically generous. They changed the the greed and the uh, consumerism and the, um, the, the me, me, me spirit that they had over them was broken when people were around Jesus. You know, His own disciples, radically changed the moment they met Him. Jesus came alongside the boat and He said to the disciples, come follow me. And the Bible says they left everything. They left their boats, they left their business, they left their families and they went and followed Jesus. They just gave up the lot. Now notice God doesn't ask everybody to give up everything. Zacchaeus gave away half, that was pretty generous. Jesus didn't say, well, now give me the other half. 
because Jesus requires different things of different people. But he didn't need to say anything to Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus' heart just was generous anyway. And that's what Jesus is looking for. And you know, the early church was marked by its generosity. People who came together and founded the first church, they did things that are just not natural. They're not human. And what I mean by that is that we default to greed. We default to possessiveness. But the early Christians, they became radically generous in a way that people are just not like that anywhere that I've ever come across. Let's look at it in Acts chapter 244. It says, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. Do you understand what that means? It means that they just shared everything. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, some of you will think, oh my goodness, this sounds like some weird commune. You know, where they just come together and that, that, you know, it sounds like places we've heard of where, you know, people have to, you know, they don't get paid and they have sort of long labour hours and all that sort of stuff. Read between the lines. <laughs> but you know what? These people did not separate themselves from the world. They were in the world. They were living in their own homes. But they were radically generous with the community, radically generous with their church people and radically generous with the community. And we see as we go on in Acts 4.32, all the believers were, were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions were his own, but they shared everything they had. So they had possessions, but they shared them. Uh, verse 34, there were no needy persons among them. Isn't that incredible? If you looked around the Christian community, there was nobody that was needy. So if somebody came and said, I've got something to give away, who needs it? They would say, sorry, we haven't got anyone in need here. That's a phenomenal problem to have, isn't it? We can't find any needy people. There were no needy people among them for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses, nothing wrong with owning lands and houses, they sold them, they brought the money from the sales and they put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. See, people owned their houses and they owned land and they had possessions and there was nothing wrong with that. But sometimes they would see another person in need and they think, you know what? I've actually got a house and I've got what I need. If I sold that, I could actually help all these other people to be able to benefit. And so that's what they did. Nobody asked them to do it. Nobody forced them to do it. There was no law that said they had to do it. There was something in their hearts that said, I have been so changed by Jesus that, that, that it wouldn't feel right that if I had all this extra stuff, if I didn't give it to help somebody else. You see, just as, um, just as radical generosity is part of the kingdom, greed is the antithesis as, as, uh, to the things of God. Do you know we are born, I think, greedy. We're born greedy. It's our default mechanism. We want things for ourselves. Have you noticed that you don't have to teach a child how to be greedy? You know, you, you have to teach a child how to, how, to, how to share. It is not a natural thing for a child, I, I don't think, to, to, to be generous. We have to teach them what to do. I remember taking my kids to McDonald's uh, when they were young and, and they would say what they wanted and then they would fight if the other one had something different, you know? They were not fighting to want to give things away. They were fighting to take things for themselves. I remember taking one of my sons to McDonald's, just him and I once, and um, I bought a whole lot of fries or something unhealthy and, um, you know, put it over to him and put some sauce and, and he was eating away there. And I said, can Daddy have a chip? And he said, no. I said, can I just have one chip? No, mine. I said, oh, you'd let me have a chip. No, mine. <laughs> Who bought the chips? <laughs> Daddy. Whose chips are they? Mine. <laughs> Hold on a second. I bought you this. I provided all of this and suddenly it's yours, you know, and I can't have any of it. And friends, that's the condition of the human heart. It is difficult to teach people to share. And it's something that, that we learn to do. But I think that God has to teach the same thing to us because sometimes as adults, we don't learn that, that thing that we teach children. We don't learn to share. When we've got things, we say, no, mine. And friends, that is a demonic thing that it's in our heart. No, mine. Where did it come from? 
Well, it came from you, Lord. So whose is it? Mine. It's mine. Friends, actually the Bible teaches us that everything is God's. And we have to learn how to share as well. I made a terrible mistake in this last week. I've got a little grandson who was here earlier this morning and um, he's frightened of going to the dental nurse because they put buzzy things into your mouth and he doesn't like the buzzy things. So I said to my son and daughter-in-law, I'll buy them a little, I'll buy him a little electric toothbrush. So he's used to having a buzzy thing in his mouth and my, um, the parents thought that was a great idea. So I thought I'd better buy one for the, the, his sister as well. So, and I've got another grandchild and they're all coming over, but I thought she's too little to have a, a, um, a toothbrush. So, I'll, uh, you know, an electric toothbrush. So I'll just get her a wee book. So anyway, we were all together and I had a big bag. And first of all, to the, the tiniest granddaughter, I gave her the book. There you are, sweetheart. There's a the book. She's two years old. She was so happy. Next one, I said, here's a toothbrush for you, electric toothbrush. And all hell broke loose. <laughs> the, the little one said, mine, mine, mine. And I finished and gave, you know, a toothbrush to the other one. So two had toothbrushes and one didn't. And this little girl, she's just turned two. She went over to the bag where I was and looked inside to see if there was another toothbrush. And she was so upset, so she lay on the floor and cried. (laughs) And my son said to me, said, Dad, just a little lesson, always buy them exactly the same thing. (laughs) But my little three-year-old... Three-year-old granddaughter, she went over to, see what, as soon as they got the toothbrushes, they were doing their hair and they were doing their feet and they were doing their arms and they were doing all sorts of things. So they're having a lot of fun with them. So I can understand why the two-year-old wanted one as well. But the three-year-old went over to the one that missed out and said, and handed to her and says, you can share. Isn't that great? And I thought, I said, you're going to get an extra treat to this little one because, you know, and then of course you've got to get them all treats, you know, but... But then I made a, a fatal mistake the week after. I thought, well, I'll get this other little one a, um, a toothbrush as well. And I thought the other two won't mind because they had one last week. So I gave one to this one and, and the three-year-old who'd been so generous said, that's my toothbrush. And then we'll start the whole thing over again. <clears throat> but you know what? Greed is a thing that's innate in us and it actually almost has to be exorcised out. You know, we, we actually have to constant, we have to intentionally learn to become generous because generosity is actually a thing of God. It, it is the antithesis of the work um, of the enemy. And what happens is greed can be a pride thing. It's a, it's a thing that's saying, you know, I love to have a lot of stuff. Um, It can also be a fear thing. I'm scared of missing out. But also it can be a defiance against God. It's, It's defying the fact that everything we have comes from Him. Tim Keller, wonderful pastor who passed away recently said this, a lack of generosity refuses to acknowledge that your assets are not really yours, but God's. You know, it's a terrible sin to have things and to not share with others. Jesus told this story in Luke 16, 19 to 31. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered in sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Remember, this is a story Jesus is telling. But Abraham replied, Son, remember in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to him. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Terrifying story. This is a story that Jesus told. Here's a man that has great riches, 
He's very, very wealthy. Now, the Bible doesn't say that he's done anything wrong. Like he's not a thief, he's not crooked. You know, he's probably a good Jewish man. He probably goes to the, the synagogue each week. He probably pays his tithe. He probably, in the world's eyes, he was probably a good man. But he had a man who was very poor outside his house. He wasn't a relative. He wasn't a family, part of his family. He was just a poor man that probably had no relationship to the rich man whatsoever. Is he responsible for that man? Well, it seems to be that Jesus thought he was. And he ties it together in verse 15, 25 rather, where where it says, Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted and you are in agony. Jesus directly ties the fact that this man was very wealthy. He had need right in front of him and he completely ignored it. And Jesus said to him, you are in agony and Lazarus is now in comfort. He ties these things together. Friends, this is scary stuff. You don't build large churches by preaching this sort of stuff because people hate it. But it's actually the truth that Jesus taught, that it is a sin to have an enormous amount of wealth and not care about need that is directly in front of us. Jesus warned over and over again about not becoming greedy. Luke 12, 15 to 21, Jesus said, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And He told this parable, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be, says Jesus, with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich with God. So here's this guy. Now, most of us would just call him a really smart businessman. I mean, what's he done wrong? What's he done wrong? He just does what every good businessman would do. He's done really well in business, so he builds bigger facilities to hold all the things that he's got. And he says, I'm just gonna build the biggest things I have. I'm gonna keep all my riches there and then I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna retire and I'm gonna be at peace. And God says, you fool, because you've been rich with yourself, but you have not been rich with God. In other words, you have not cared about the need around. You've not cared about the Kingdom of God. Friends, these are warnings for all of us. And there's nothing wrong with having houses and barns and stuff, but we just need to remember it all comes from God and God does hold us accountable with what we do for it. And it is the sign of a person that is unregenerate. It is a person that has not been affected by God. It's basically saying, I do not care that God has given me everything. I'm not gonna take responsibility for that. When we need to be accountable for everything that we have. Jesus said in Mark 8 verse 36, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? I'm very blessed because I come from a long line of people who have been generous. I And many of you have, I know as well. Do you know what? Generosity does pass down through the generations. And I know we have massively generous people in our church. And we have, you know, even as I was going out, I saw some, you know, some young families and I thought, you come from generations of people that have been generous. I'm not talking about giving necessary money to the church, but just in the way they live their lives, they are helping. They are um, they are helping the community. They're just their lives are just outward looking, and that travels down the generations. I mentioned in the past about my great great grandfather who built a church. He was a very wealthy farmer, built a church at a Little Akaloa, Couldn't raise the funds properly for it, so he built it, paid for it himself, and did Māori carving all the way through, and it's a heritage um, 
It's, it's a heritage uh, building now. His son, uh, or his son-in-law actually, my great-grandfather, was also a very wealthy farmer and was an incredibly generous man. Everywhere you go, you see things that, that my grandfather, great-grandfather invested in. Uh, he actually had a person that was not a blood relative, but he saw this man was not doing well. He gifted him a whole farm. And then my grandfather um, was, a, was a farmer. I don't know how wealthy he was. I don't think the farms were booming quite so much at that stage. But um, once again, I have all these stories about them building houses for people and taking people onto their farm. There was a, uh, a fisherman that drowned and left a wife and family and they took this whole family in and looked after them uh, until they could get on their feet. There were people that they gave free holidays to up the Kaikoura coast where um, they lived they plant, my grandfather planted fruit trees all the way along because he saw the tourists come and thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if they can stop and have free fruit all the way up? I mean, it's just, it's thinking about other people. And there's these stories of, of, of the generosity of just giving things, things away, you know, helping other people. And look, as I come to a close, even in this church, there are so many things that happen that nobody would ever know. You know, we, there was a guy in our church that heard that there was a family who had lost a parent and all the kids needed braces. So he, he said, I'm going to pay for the braces. Does anyone know how expensive braces are for kids? Oh my goodness, you need to mortgage a house to be able to get them. Um, but but uh, he paid for these kids to have braces. We've had families that have come along that would have loved to have their kids go to a Christian private school. And people have said, I will pay for all your children to go through their schooling there. And I'll pay for their uniforms and I'll pay for their books. And sometimes families have joined together to be able to do this. We've had multiple cars that have been given away. We've, people that are, we've had people that have fixed people's cars for free. We've had people that um, have had different trades things going on and we've whispered in the ear of some, somebody and they've come and fixed the whole thing up. We've had garden makeovers. We've had houses being redone. We've, we've just, I'm so proud of the generosity of the people uh, uh, who are, are here. And some people don't have much money, but what they do have is a generous heart. They've got a heart that says, you know what? I don't have much to give, but I can give time and I can give my talent and I can give my resources. And we have people that are, that are giving what would be an enormous amount in services, you know, their goods and services uh, to help people to be able to come forward. Friends, you know what you call that? You call it Christianity. And I feel proud of being part of a community that is so incredibly generous. And from time to time, we talk about these things so it just continues to travel from one generation to the next generation. We have one group of people come through, they become very generous. And then the next come through and we're having more and more people join. And we're saying to people, you know what? This is our culture. Nobody checks up. Nobody goes through and says, is this person being generous? We just put it out there and say, this is who we wanna be. We wanna be a radically generous community. A woman came to me once, and very, very wealthy woman, and she said, you know, I feel that uh, I'm actually a greedy person because I love getting things for myself and I can't give things away. What do I do? I said, well, where you start is you do actually start in just giving something as small as you can, give it away to somebody, ask God to show you some need. She actually became one of the most generous people that I'd ever met. Because what happened, she started with something small and then she gave a bit more and a bit more and she started helping all these people quietly behind the scenes. Friends, God doesn't look at amounts. He looks at the heart. And we see that, this is the final thing I'll do here in Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sat opposite the place where the offerings were paid out and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. God does watch what we do with all of our money. Many rich people threw in large amounts. This was their tithe. They were coming in and throwing large amounts in. It was, the, it was 10% of what they had. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth, worth only a fraction of a penny. So part of a, you know, not even a one cent piece. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. See, Jesus didn't care about the amount. 
You know, I've told stories today about people who have done radical things, but you can do just as radical things with your attitude of heart and something tiny. You're not a hero necessarily if you can do some large thing with your money. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to do, but you're a hero if you've got a, a generous heart. And a generous heart can be something that gives some flowers or takes some time or, or just does something with your gifts and talents that are a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice that counts, not the amount. And, and God is just looking for the hearts. See, He looked at all the people who were giving in that temple and He focused on this poor widow. That people would have seen those coins and I was like, well, what's that gonna do? Who cares? What's that gonna change? But it moved the heart of Almighty God. Moved His heart. And friends, that's what God's looking for today. And sometimes we've got to deal with our attitudes too. Because we can have excuses why we can't be generous. Can I make an admission? We were driving somewhere um, in the last few days and we came to this intersection and there was a woman begging for food. You know how they go up and they knock on the doors and knock on the windows at you're in the, in the intersection. And um, so my wife was actually driving the car and she um, said, have you got any money? And I said, no, which was the truth. I didn't have any money. And um, I had this judgment in my heart and I thought to myself, you know, I looked at the person and I thought, I know you're gonna spend this on either booze or drugs. Isn't that a terrible thing to think? But I'm just being honest here. And I said, have you got any money? And she said, no, I haven't. She said, but I'll check in my, my wallet. And she checked and she said, oh, I was keeping this aside for something I had to pay for, $50. And she said, what do you think? And I said, well, you know what it's gonna be spent on, don't you? And she said, honey, that's not the point, is it? I said, no, it's not the point. So we rolled down the windows and gave us and this young woman's eyes just, you know, turned like saucers and she was so pleased. And I thought to myself as she went away, she looked so happy. I thought, who cares what it's spent on? Who cares? Because what we did was a kingdom thing. And I'm not saying that to skite and I'll lose any reward I possibly would have got because I've told you, haven't done it quietly. <laughs> but, but I thought, who cares? We've shown the kingdom to this lady. And that's our responsibility and what she does with it is hers. But God's just saying He wants us to have His heart. And I praise God we're in such a generous church and may you continue to be generous in all you do. Let's all stand together.